do is a test on YouTube now. Because I'm always trying something a little bit different. But I, I've upped my game on the thumbnails and titles to be a bit more interesting, you know, per se, for live stream or for video fans, I guess. But for live streams, people are, I believe people are more interested in what you're doing, actually, rather than um, what you're talking about, which makes sense. You know, when I started oil painting, live streaming, I was getting all kinds of views with the oil painting. People want to see, oh, this guy's oil painting. Let me see that. My bell's going to go off in a second. But when I'm, I'm drawing these heads and I'm doing studies, uh, it doesn't, doesn't really resonate for, you know, a live stream. But honestly, I'm, I'm okay with that. There it is. I'm okay with that because I can attach, you know, being a, on video and we had talked about this before, you know, stacking things. And that's, I think that's the next video that I'm going to do. I can do my artwork. I can learn something new. I can talk with friends. And I can record it and possibly increase my network as well. Um, and do all the social media stuff all at the same time. There's like so much goodness going on here that I don't want to stop it. I'm not worried too much about the views, that kind of thing. So it's going to be a laid back live stream this morning, guys. Just kind of chilling and drawing. Uh, the topic that I, that I wanted to kind of discuss is um, how important is accuracy? I, I did a poll on YouTube, and I don't get a lot of people that answer the polls on YouTube. But this is the first time that I had a poll with a huge margin of difference. And I asked what is more important, speed or accuracy? And it was 10% speed, 90% accuracy. That's like the votes that came through. Wow, I'm really focusing on accuracy right now. And I want to get what, you know, your opinion, both of your, you guys' opinion on this. What do you think is more important, speed or accuracy? Well, my own opinion is accuracy over speed, but, uh, you know, I'm a very slow painter, so. Yeah. No, that's fine. I'm in, the opposite. I'm in the opposite camp, so I uh, I think accuracy comes with reps. And the more you train your hand-eye coordination, and that means homing in on accuracy by doing more. <laughs> yeah, I can see that. The more yeah, you're doing you're saying it actually the same thing because accuracy is important and speed is oh, important yeah. too but the only way you get to speed is through uh, repetition which I totally agree with oh yeah yeah but I think the, the inverse is also true so I don't think that they are uh, I don't think there's a causation but there is a correlation so you can approach it either way you can get faster by focusing on the accuracy or you can get more accuracy by focusing on being fast. So it, it's, it's not either or it's both and. Right. Uh, that's interesting. So uh, in this, in this aspect, we're talking really about methodologies to, you know, how do you want to be more accurate? I kind of like Josh's way because you're stacking something else and I'm all about stacking more things, you know, to get more done with each stroke. Um, where, you, and if, if, if I understand you correctly, Josh, is basically you arrive at the accuracy 
after you do something like I'm doing. Well, not the specific head drawing because I'm being way too accurate and taking my sweet time on it. Um, is you just do a whole ton of them over and over again as quick as you can. And then you, right. learn, yeah, you learn that way. Now, the, I was a very slow, deliberate, careful artist for a very long time. And it was actually watching concept artists um, that really encouraged me to think of it differently. Um, so if you see any concept artist trying to address a weakness, they don't do it slowly and deliberately. They, they start doing speed paints of whatever they're weak in and not time lapses, but speed paints. They will see how fast they can paint this environment or how fast they can paint these portraits. And the reason they do that is because they're, they're internalizing the, the methodology is quick. As quickly as possible. You kind of, right, right. You kind of cut off at the end there. How much of that do you think is predicated by their uh, industry that they need to be in? Oh, I, I, I think it's entirely predicated by the industry that they're in, but the, the industry that they're in has exposed them to a shortcut, basically. Um, so whatever industry it is, I think that if you can, if you can borrow from other, uh, other best practices from, from any industry, why not? <laughs> so let, let's get practical with it. Cause I, you know, I always like practicality within everything that we talk about because inevitably if we postulate some kind of methodology the next question that um, individuals will ask like myself is all right I want to do this painting uh, what's the best way to do it so for example you know I'm always gonna bring this painting up this is the outrage painting the one that's kind of sparked all the head study that I'm doing right now and what I'm doing is a bunch of head studies Although, one thing I do need to work on is getting them done a lot faster. <laughs> but Doug was working on and has finished with a B painting that is for a specific event, right, Doug? That's correct. Yeah. And how would, how would we change up Doug's methodology for the painting? Man, I put that on the wrong layer. I didn't create a new layer. That's okay. No big deal. Um, like, how would Doug's methodology change? Actually, is it, what was your methodology for going after the B painting and, and completing that, Doug? Uh, just the first thing I did was to uh, get a picture off the internet of some bees. And then uh, actually manipulated it within Krita to uh, copy a B because I wanted three Bs instead of just uh, two that I saw on the photo that I had taken. And then I made up a bunch of flowers and an atmosphere, uh, you know, uh, from beginning to end. So it, the only mm -hmm. thing that was real was the uh, bees themselves. Kind of real. Oh, okay. Nice. Now, Josh, with the, the quick method, like, you know, doing things as quick as possible, is that does that only apply to when you find a shortcoming? Or is this something that you think should be done even for finished paintings, like your recent painting that you did that ended up being uh, a thumbnail for your latest video. I don't see him on the call anymore. Oh, no. He must have dropped off. He was driving. 
Yeah, because he, he was doing... He actually spent quite a bit of time on that painting. I know, I mean, he was working... Uh, really enjoying it, working on it a lot. So, you know, just kind of delve, trying to get to the bottom of it, like where is, where should the, the accuracy practice happen? Where should the speed happen, mainly? Like when I was doing the tiger painting, you know, we're deep into it. How am I going to speed this up? Well, the only way I could speed it up is to, um, you know, do more impressionistic strokes. But at that point, I would... I know that I don't have this definite ability to paint that way, so I'd have to train it and then maybe do a, a lot of impressionistic paintings. Sarah Sedwick has a uh, interesting exercise. Uh, she does still lives. Oh, yeah, I remember and, her. And she uh, sets out her still life and then uh, basically just one fruit or whatever and says okay paint this in 10 strokes that's it period yeah as an exercise to get more impressionistic to force yourself to you know do the swirl so that you can uh, uh demonstrate the outside of an apple or something yeah uh, so and then you go down from 10 to like uh, five. No, oh, wow. To describe an apple in five strokes of the paintbrush, which definitely forces you into impressionism. I, I'm glad you mentioned her. I totally forgot about Sarah Sedwick. I, I used to look at her a lot. Uh, well, she's no longer uh, publishing on a regular basis on YouTube. Oh. Maybe she's she... more dealing with her um, her practice and her uh, teaching and, and things of that nature. So. Yeah, because she's built a network and then kind of uh, have enough people to, to sustain her workshops and things, I bet. Now, she, she uh, really came from the Carol Marine um, Kind of group. Carol Marine was doing, she was part of the, the daily painting thing that I, uh, she would do a, a painting a day basically. She's got a ton of paintings. She has a whole book and, and I believe she's the one that started that initial practice on as just minimal strokes as possible. And yeah, she has some beautiful work too. So pretty, pretty similar. But a little bit it's more a, impressionistic, I would think. It's a real good exercise to uh, loosen up uh, quite a bit. Yeah, but that you is. You have to think ahead of time before you place oh, paint to canvas. Look how simple that is. Yeah. I love that. All these like little. That's got to be like four by four painting. What is it? Six by six. <laughs> That's beautiful. I'd buy that. I'd live with that. Yeah. Like she's got everything is sold on here. <laughs> that's fantastic. Uh, thank you, Doug. I, I completely forgot about them, and I think that's a great idea. I don't know how it would translate to uh, digital, though. Take a take a big brush and put in one color, or uh, I just don't know how it would happen. Yeah, I know. That would be like the next thing to figure out. Like, how can we bring that practice into the digital sphere? I think it would be really interesting. I mean, I would probably pick out one of these big chunky brushes like this guy. <laughs> wow, that's that is just so huge. I mean, you know, I'm uncomfortable just even thinking about that. And I then, know. And then how would it translate to figurative work, right? Like exactly. Would it, would it be this big, like, swath of color? <laughs> I don't even have my, I don't even have my uh, color picker out. Let's just do it all in orange and yellow. <laughs> it's like, well, at this point. Up three, you're already up to three strokes. You got two more left. <laughs> yeah, I'm, okay. Annie. <laughs> wow. Like five strokes of the head. 
That that is really interesting. Yeah, I don't know if she would she would do a portrait that way, you know, translating it down in five strokes. Although you could do the shadows and you know the eye uh, sockets and things like that. Actually, if if I did Dread. that, it would just be this one, <laughs> and then the the dark side of the head would be two. That's and then three, there, three, four. Oh, that would need six strokes. <laughs> no, I need seven or eight. There we go. Yeah, you know, uh, it's it sure looks like accuracy suffers. <laughs> Just a little bit. Just a little bit. Oh, that's that's awesome. And to see the the key to that, I, I get the other key to that because, you know, do that and make a good painting as well. I well, not at the beginning. Oh my God! I mean, if you go to Carol Marine, Carol Marine's website, it's carolmarine.com. C A R O L Marine, as in, you know, the ocean or close to it. Uh, and just look at her still life page. I'm scrolling forever. There, there, guys. There, there has to be two thousand or three or four thousand paintings on this page, and every single one has a red dot. I mean, she's made um, a living out of doing these beautiful still lives, all the way up until the last four that she's done. Um, everything else is sold and she's selling these for like 120, 140 bucks a pop <laughs> I mean if, if that's uh, not uh, motivating I don't know what is it's pretty motivating to me yeah but translating it into portraiture is uh, a little bit different I think you know it's it's a really good example a really good conversation to talk about um, you know when we're talking about speed versus accuracy in this aspect and obviously Carol Maureen and Sarah, Sarah Sedwick can could probably take care of those paintings in a lot faster mode than I can especially when they're six by six and they're pretty and they're selling all the time right um, it kind of says, you know, accuracy is really not that important, is it? Right? Like, and then, I, you know, like everything we talk about. Let me go into the next head while I talk so I can train that as well. And I've, I've talked about this before. Everything we talk about is, is on a spectrum, right? So we got photo over here, or photo, you know, and you know, there there's two pieces of language out there that I find really annoying here is photorealism and hyperrealism. It's and I've seen people kind of go all over the place, like, oh, you, you paint hyperrealism. No, I do not. I don't even paint photorealism. There's difference. But I'm gonna say far to the right is reproducing the photo, and far to the left would be um, abstraction. So that's the spectrum. And where would we place Carol Marine on this thing? I think she's kind of this like perfect in between, you know? This kind of place where it's almost abstract, but you can tell what it is, right? And you have to kind of determine where you want to be. Like, uh, Sergeant would be probably, I would say, a bit further up from Carol Marine. I would agree. Yeah. But you I'm know. always impressed with uh, Sergeant and, you know, what appears to be a flick of a, uh, of a brush, you know, right. and you have the perfect rendition of a woman's dresses button 
yes. with one stroke. I mean, it just just floors me. Yeah. What you have to remember about Sergeant, though, is is he trained that specifically. Um, like if you, because I I read some you know. Uh, I guess, accounts of how Sargent would paint. And it would be, you know, practice, practice, practice of the stroke, kind of like over, and then put the stroke down. And then if he didn't like it, he would scrape it off and then try again. Didn't like it, he'd scrape it off. And then he would do that with like the whole head. If he didn't like the entire head, he would scrape it off. They've done heads like 26 times because it didn't have that, it didn't look like it was dashed onto the canvas. But anyway, um, my, I guess my point within within this spectrum is when you look at Carol Maureen and you look at Sarah Sedwick, they don't have this photorealistic accuracy, but they are at a point where you can tell what it is um, and it's accurate enough. The question is for you is how accurate do you want to be? How where are you on the scale with uh, you know Sarah Sedwick and, and uh, yeah you know, others, where do you where do you want to be? Yeah, like I feel like that myself. I'm way up here with my paintings. I I get way too photorealistic with them, and you're and I look at Carol Marine. I look at Sarah Sedwick. I look at uh, Sargent, Soroya, um, Zorn. I look, you know, all and a ton of contemporary artists. I, I mean, we were looking at, uh, there you go, bam, you know, Craig Mullins. The there's not a lot of accuracy, but it's absolutely beautiful, right? So I I want to go that way, you know. So, um, what is accurate enough? And what do you need to train to, like, to de determine where you want to be on this scale? I guess I should make this larger so everybody could see it. Determine where you want to be on this scale, and then determine what you need to do to get there. Like, if you're um, way down here with accuracy, like it's abstraction, and you want to move your way up, you know, how do you train that to do, to get better, to get a bit more accuracy? Maybe drawing, right? Because don't give me, I mean, we, we should note this, that even though we, you know, we're looking at, I should bring that down again. When we look at Kara Marine's work, she knows how to draw really well. And I love how she, she kind of breaks these things up these cups and stuff you can see are into an octagon those ellipses but those are really well formed ellipses those aren't easy to do especially in paint she's practiced like tremendously I mean look at the scroll bar here guys and every time I go to the bottom it just loads more If you do much of this, if you do this much painting, you're going to be great. Whoa. Okay. This is important. <clears throat> and I, you know, I've talked to the sidetrack on this. I've talked to multiple people about this before. If you love a person's work, look at see where they began. So this is probably like 2000 paintings ago for Carol Maureen. Look how detailed this work is. And then almost right away, she starts breaking away from that and saying, oh, I don't need to get so detailed. So we have this tendency to look at artists at the end of their journey, especially with artists that are dead, you know, dead masters. A lot of artists don't show their journey. Look at how they began. Look how they worked through it. Look at all their pitfalls um, and learn from that. It, it helps you understand that you can get there. It gives you a connection between your effort and success rather than this, you know, seeing artists as this kind of fable of tremendous ability and they just kind of manifested it right out of the womb. Yeah. 
this is really nice. look at these all day, but I won't because we're on the live stream. So if like I was, I said before, oh, go ahead. like I said before, get to work. Yes, <laughs> get to work. All right. But if I was Stephen Bauman and I love the academic approach of drawing, which he does, and a lot of individuals do. There's uh, another guy on New Masters Academy, Ilya... Russian name, that I, I am not even going to try and pronounce. Um, and he is, comes out of like that Russian academic approach of things. Their accuracy is through the roof and they spend a lot of time getting things just perfect right that's their preference of work uh, how they prefer to work and I think determining that for yourself for ourselves you know how accurate do I really want to work is really important I'm gonna chop off these sides of the head that's a bit more accurate how accurate do I want to be on these these head drawings. What's the purpose of these head drawings? The purpose of these head drawings is for me to speed through them. So this one, I'm going to speed through. I'm going to kind of reassess the purpose for these and get back to the speed. Oof. But, you know, I am not going to let that line go. I'm sorry. That was just, that angle is way off. Control Z is your friend. Yeah, or just plain control. I mean, if I had the control, I wouldn't have to Z. <laughs> there you go. You can put that on a cereal box. That was a pretty good quote. I was ha I'm happy with that one. If you had more control, you wouldn't have to Z. And how are you? And I'm trying to gain that control by doing a ton of reps, building those muscles. Okay, next thing here, let's do the chin. Just a generalized chin. Wow, that needs to be cut off again. Actually, I find it quicker to just tap brushes rather than hitting E hairline. I always like put in the hairline now. I want to get in these angles. I like those angles. The cheek. Don't forget the, the one thing that I was doing a lot of is forgetting the width of the chin before putting those angles in. And for the neck, I look at that kind of pit of the neck, which is right here. And this guy's clavicles are going way up, like this way. And his traps are back here. Right in between all of that is the neck hole. And because he's facing us, that ellipse will be really open. More like a circle. I didn't do these lines that go back. All right, let's test it. So that was really fast. For me, that's another thing. Speed. Um, takes time. You know, determine what it, what fast is for you as well. I think is important. Oh, that center line. I'm gonna be way off on. I can't even trace it right. <laughs> You definitely need a vacation. I do. I do. I really do. It's going to be a real vacation, not one of those ones where you're like, oh, I'll, I'll, you know, look at my laptop and maybe try and get a live stream in or 
work on my videos or something like that. No, this is going to be a real look at the ocean. Look at the trees. Wow, did I get that size like perfect? You see that? I didn't even have to adjust the size. I just moved it straight over. Wow, that... Okay, I'm pretty happy with how close that is. I'm going to put... This is going to be in teal. Fast and very close. So the teal is when I do th things good. Uh, the only thing that's off is neck placement. Still getting that feedback in there. Oh, that's right. I repeated this. This crazy practice. Same head, upside down. No, not red. The more I do the circle now, the more I'm thinking I don't want to do the circle anymore. Or the sphere. I have to always see it as a sphere. Did Josh actually show up again? Are you there, Josh? Yeah, I'm back. I said that in a weird way. Are you able to connect again, not actually show up? <laughs> Sounds like... Yeah, yeah Sorry. I'm back. And, and able to connect. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for coming back. Welcome. That that last one was very impressive, honestly. That that was that was a very well done head. Thank you. Are you driving still? Yeah, yeah, I'm still driving. Oh, okay. Well stop looking at what I'm doing. Look at the road. <laughs> I was gonna stop what? Uh, oh, okay, okay. <laughs> Just be careful. <laughs> and the, the, the tiny one is screaming at me, so I'm going to mute. Yeah, that's fine. Me and my wife always say, because uh, we all, all of us say, be safe, right? Be safe. But how, how do you be safe? Instead, we say, be attentive. You know, when you're driving, because that's, that's how you be safe. A little bit more actionable in our weird way of doing things. Um, wow, those angles go this way. And the neck. Oops, went into the head. I don't care. That's not a big deal. The pit is there. I knew from the last one I need to squish it up a bit. Hopefully I've done that well. Alright, let's test it. Oh, jeez. I created a new color. That's okay. Here's what I feel like I've determined from the conversation on what is more important, accuracy or, or speed. You know, I didn't even do that line at all. Is... Hmm. And now that I'm going to say it, I'm not sure if, if I've really determined this, but speed is used for learning. only maybe see it doesn't sound right now that I'm saying it but it seems like um, if you need to learn something iterate through it quickly and get as much reps in as possible kind of like exercising you know building be, um, you know doing weights and things like that weight training But then we look at Carol Marine and Sarah Sedwick, and they have a bunch of really beautiful paintings that uh, they've obviously done quickly because they've they've the speed 
matches, or at least the method that they're using matches speed in some way. Yeah. So I'm gonna say this line here is off. No line. <laughs> uh, brow angle. But you know, the, the good thing about this is uh, overall head shape is good. Yeah, I got that neck on. Look at that. Did that well. Okay, um, that was 50 heads. Took me a little bit longer than I, I wanted to on the heads. I can't remember. It was, we, didn't, we didn't start this yesterday. And not the day before yesterday. So like three days to do 50 heads, because that's how much time I had. It's hard for me to, while I'm drawing, to formulate a real kind of practical approach to when to use speed and when to focus on accuracy. So help me out here, Doug and Josh. Okay, you guys are maybe disconnected, but that's okay. Or maybe I disconnected. <laughs> no, I think, I, I think, you know, in your construction, you can be very speedy. Uh, but once you get to the painting, uh, it all depends on your style of splotches. How big are the splotches? Yeah. Would, would you say that if you identify a weak spot and let's say a uh, finish who is on here every now and then um, he identified that you know he needs to learn anatomy and hands uh, specifically uh, would you suggest that he do you know kind of rapid testing or rapid um, quick oh my god I can't talk while I'm drawing would you suggest that he does kind of a rapid practice like this hands over and over and over again as quick as possible yeah because as we've said repetition is the yeah. mother of skill and then eventually bring that back into you know the painting kind of like I'm doing that right now yeah so this practice I think is I think this is good, what we're, what I'm doing here. Now, if I was Carol Marine or Sarah Sedwick, um, especially Carol Marine, I, ha you know, I have this style that I've developed or want to do. Maybe I want to paint like Carol Marine, which is very simplistic, or Sargent, or um, Monet, Zorn, Soroya all these amazing masters of art. If I wanted to paint like one of those guys, I would probably do the same. I would probably have a practice where I speed through just a bunch of small paintings and, you know, get a better understanding of, you know, how to describe form quickly and easily. So Sykra, Sykra, I can't remember his last name, but YouTube artist, he, he did the uh, two videos on iterative drawing. So, he, he, he was very wordy about it, but yes. <laughs> the, the gist of it, as far as I could tell, was to approach it quickly, but also like a scientist. So you're, you're, you're putting in the reps but you're also testing things to see, you know, what works with each little micro study. So you're like, okay, well, if I move the eyes up a little bit, what happens? Well, that's what happens. All right, if I move 
uh, what, what if I make every chin I do pointy? Okay, well, that's kind of interesting. Maybe I could integrate that for, um, in, in your case, you're going for speed and accuracy. So you're just like, well, how quickly can I be accurate? Um, and, and I think approaching these studies quickly, like repeating quickly and iterating on you know, what what do I need to take? What do I need to take more time with? What what can I turn into a short game? What can I what can I understand quickly? I, I think that's sort of the the happy medium where you're not just trying to be faster. You're trying to observe quickly. Hmm. Yeah, I do think that iterative approach is the best way to learn anything. And maybe that's the operative word. Learning. If, if you want to learn something quickly, use this, you know, faster iter iterative method of learning to make the, the mistakes as quick as possible. But the most important part of learning, like you said, Josh, is that feedback. We have to develop some kind of way to get the feedback and you know we're so most artists that listen and do anything are on their own so we have to develop our own ways for feedback just like i'm doing here which is more of a it's a you know the digital accuracy way of grabbing feedback is just seeing okay how close am i to the generalization of this head what are the most important angles and things like that that I need to get close to? I, I like the idea of the Carol Marine practice so much that I, I would love to do that. Here, here's, well, I, I won't get off into that, but... Um, Maybe you should try a bunch of uh, portraits in, in a 4x4 four four kind of uh, format. I was getting ready to say that, but I, I, I fear so much that uh, here, here's what I fear. Uh, I've looked at my past because I log it incessantly. I'm kind of ridiculous about that. And I uh, you know, what was it, several days ago, maybe a week ago now, I was really upset because I, I feel like I should be better than I am now, right? Uh, and I look back at my time frame of this 10 years and I can see that I'm always constantly on something else. Oof, I'm happy with that. Uh, I didn't and look at, how, look at how quick you did it. Yeah, yeah, I was able to get through that pretty fast. Let's get some feedback still. Um, I'm going to have to uh, head out again, so uh, enjoy your vacation, and uh, we'll yeah. catch you guys uh, on the other side. What what day of the week are you going to come back? Do you know? Is it going to be Saturday or that following Monday? I'm thinking the 1st of May. It's a, it seems like a really good number. First of the okay. month on May. Yeah. Hey, thanks, Doug. I really appreciate you showing up and coming to the stream and talking with me and, and being here. And, uh, yeah. First, I'll be... the, first of, the first of May is only uh, three days away, isn't it? Oh, wait. Am I saying the first? No, no, no. Yeah, I said that wrong. I'm sorry. Jeez. The 6th. 6th of May or the... Uh, uh, the 8th of May. The 8th. 8th of the May. 8th. Okay. Yeah. That sounds that yeah. sounds more like. Yeah, sorry All about right. that. 8th of May I'll be back. And uh Very good. I'll miss you until then. <laughs> <laughs> well, bring your uh sketch pad and bring a lot of pictures of uh uh people's heads. Yes, definitely. I will. I'll practice. Don't lose, don't lose the practice. Oh, heck no. No, I'll be into it. <laughs> Thanks, Doug. Have a great week. Take care. You too. Take care, Josh. Take care, Doug.
I think the really the only two big problems with this, the width of the neck here, size of ear. It looks like car. <laughs> size of car. The size of car. Oh, I didn't outline the the mouth. Eh, it's not a big deal. I think, you know, once I you know, I have the, the general set of everything. Nose is in the right place, the brow's in the right place. Uh, actually the crease in the mouth, you know, where the uh, yeah, I, I'm, that's all good. After 50, um, let's do this. Let's look back. You know, uh, roll back time. This was number one that I did several days ago. Just days ago. When did I start this? I really, I'm really interested in uh, looking at the day that I started this. I haven't uh, posted on my my daily art in a while. I need to catch up on that. So, yeah, it it, it hasn't been that long. I'll, I'll be right back though. You, you continue. <laughs> yeah, sure. I'm pretty sure I started this on April 25th. Oops. That's interesting. I hit a button and that came up. Um. Yeah, I started this Tuesday. Started this practice on Tuesday. It is now Friday. I've done 50 heads, and I've been able to improve dramatically as far as my accuracy and how quickly I can get through these heads. I'll go up to like, let's say 15. I'm getting a little bit better there. There's 25. You know, much better in some ways. Actually, this is my test after 25. And I, I started doing different tests, honestly. Different way of testing, really adjusting the methodology. That one's pretty good. Yeah, and there's my latest one. Really so develop. My question. Go ahead. My, my question to you after 50 is how much more confident do you feel in understanding the major masses of the human head? Like as, as forms, not just light and shadow shapes that you're observing. Um, hmm. This is subjective. This is a subjective feeling. Like your, your confidence level with not reproducing the human head, but understanding at least the major masses of the human head. That's, that's a really good question. I think the best way to like really, you know, get out of my comfort zone and kind of understand that is here. So let's do, let's determine what I want to do. I want to do a three quarter head. It's easier for me. So I'm picking the easier. Uh, looking left. Um, and down slightly. And I'm picking, and actually probably a better test would be if Josh picked it, but we're not going to do that yet. <laughs> so structure the head. Uh, so three-quarter head, looking left, and down slightly. Okay. So, oh, and the center angle will be... Uh, center angle will be like in that kind of angle. I don't know how to describe that angle. So it kind of slightly tilted. Tilt, that's what I was looking for. Corner, chop that off. Um, looking down slightly, so this is, this is going to be pretty important. This kind of line here it gives me that kind of direction. That's a bit, maybe a bit further down than, than I would want. But then that would put my forehead line that like this way. It wouldn't be up here. It would be down that far. Side of the cranium. Let's do a center line. Not going to be very in the center. It's going to be over to the left just slightly. 
Now the shape of the head, the face, is interesting. You don't drop a straight line down, like, like uh, the, the plane of the face, like if I do a circle, it doesn't go straight down like that with a chin out here. Wow, that's a big chin. Um, it, it doesn't go straight down with the chin this way. On every face I did, there's a curve. It kind of comes down a little bit, you know, maybe not at that, that extreme angle, but we have a curve to it. So here, we're gonna curve in, uh, not that much. We're gonna curve in just slightly. I'm gonna use the entirety of my arm to make that curve a little bit better. And then roll around on the top of the cranium, clean up these lines a little bit, because I don't like that. Okay, now, nose and chin placement. We're facing down just a little bit, so what I like to do is really look at the mass of the head up here, which what I found multiple times needs more top width every time I do it. So I kind of do kind of an idea of, you know, more width up there. And we're, we're looking slightly down, so it's not gonna be half and half. The chin's going to be less. I'm going to say right there is where we're going to put the chin. We'll put the nose line not halfway, but just slightly up as well. Same thing with the mouth. Every single mouth I've seen has always been slightly up regardless. So, And they're all at the same angle of the brow line. So there's the brow points. Now... Next thing I want to do is, let's do this, this side chin line. Female face, it's gonna maybe, well, no, it depends. It depends on the person, because I've seen female heads with chins that go at really slight angles, and I've seen ones that are really broad. Oof, as soon as I put that in, it didn't feel good. Okay, what's wrong here? There's a lot, lot going on that, that doesn't feel right. It looks wonky, it doesn't look right. The fact that I feel that, I feel good about. The fact that I can understand that, I feel good about. I think most of the chins that I've always looked at was kind of doing this thing. There's a bit of a, a crease there, a bit of a, a change in direction. I don't like all the scratchy lines I'm doing here, but that's okay. I, I will do those um, and say it's okay because I'm out of my comfort zone. I'm not training beautiful lines right now. So let's sacrifice the lines and um, to get something more important. Neck is always going to go right up behind the ear from what I've observed. And I'm going to point the neck kind of in this angle as well. Let's say the pit in the neck is probably right there. Shoulders, something like that. Let's do the hairline. Once we get up here, the hairline is going to change angles, in my opinion. That's wrong. I know that that's not right. Why is that not right? Because, you know, after all the heads that I've done, I know that we have a larger space here for the eye socket. And it'll kind of come down this way a bit more. Now, did I draw a great head? No. That's not a, that's not a beautiful head. But my, my capability of describing what I'm doing here and giving reasons why I'm doing this, um, I'm really happy with. I wish it was a better head, but that's okay, because most of the time I'll be going off images anyways. Um, I can continually train this. I can draw heads from memory if I wanted to, but not right now. But yeah, so back to your question. Am I more confident than I used to be? Uh, resounding yes. Yes. Tremendously more confident. 
than I used to be. Yeah, just listening to the language you were using while you were going through that drawing from imagination and memory. So you, you have these, you, you created these pathways in your mind. It's like, well, from experience, I know that I can slide them out up or down on this form, but typically I need to slide them out up slightly from where I usually do. Mm-hmm. And you, you were you were talking using very spatial terms rather than uh, rather than, than flat terms. So yeah. before, like watching you watching you reproduce something, it was it was always you know angles, angles, flat angles. Yeah. The shadow comes up this way at this angle. It wasn't this shadow wraps around this form. <laughs> Yeah, that's true. That's a really good point. You know, how we, it really has changed my language, the way I'm using, you know, these things. They're really thinking about it. So I guess the next question is, do I continue on to a hundred? I'm kind of leaning towards yes. And, and the reason why I say that is because one practice that I do with the uh, with the design process. I have this whole design process document where you go through like 10 thumbnails. And so I have a line of five thumbnails, two, three, four, five, and then five underneath that as well. And, you know, I, I would do a composition in each one and then do the sixth, seventh, and usually around seven or eight, I'm like, okay, I found my composition. And then I'll do eight, I'm like, okay, let's let's push that composition. And I'm like, do I really need to do nine and 10? Hmm, I'll do it anyways. And sometimes I get some tremendous breakthrough because eight is what I want. And then I say, well, the only thing to do with these last two is something crazy different you know i'm not as i'm thinking about that i'm not sure if it translates but what i'm thinking about is you know those that last kind of few is where i tend to learn something more about myself and not something different and this is the first time i've ever done this exercise and if you know as a teacher as a person that wants to impart more information I think I need to figure out if it's worth it or not. What's your take on that, Josh? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. There's, yeah. A, there's a nuance there that I think is worth exploring. So, yes, you may you may learn something really fascinating with the last fifty heads. Right. Um, would now be the time to add complexity to those heads to see if that's where the uh, where the fascinating information is. Right. Um, could you could you move on to the simple sorrow head for the next fifty? Could you? I think um, honestly, here's what I'm thinking. Uh, I think fifty is enough for this Loomis method because I've already been adjusting the Loomis method. I think the next step is doing another 50, but do it with the Houston method. Houston, we have a problem. Um, and I'm not, actually, I don't really like the sale that uh, Steve Houston uses. So, okay, let me, I got his book open. So for individuals that don't understand what I'm talking about, this is the sale that Steve Houston does. So he'll, he'll do a human head this way and the neck that way. I'm actually copying directly from his book, which is Steve Houston's Figure Drawing for Artists. It's a great book. I love the book. It's meandering and kind of all over the place a little bit, but there's a lot of nuggets of wisdom. So he does this kind of sail shape for a really quick... Um, what's the terminology I'm looking for? 
yeah, a basic, yeah, really quick gesture of the head, you know, it's, it dumbs down the head tremendously. But he also shows three different other methods and how he arrived at the sale. And one head is this kind of, ooh, it's a fatter oval than that. One head is this oval here, and then you take that exact same oval, and you repeat it this way, and uh, he says something like, um, it risks being too rounded in the face, creating a sloping forehead and a weak chin. So the ear would be here, neck, this kind of very weak chin. You see what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah. And anybody out there has a weak chin, it's perfectly fine. Weak chins are great. You're beautiful. Don't worry about the weak chin, okay? That's why I never shave my goatee, actually. <laughs> <laughs> and then the next one he shows is that the real cranium, well, more closer to a real cranium shape, you know, this shape here. And then he drops the front of the face down. And then a sharper chin. And I think he doesn't really divide in half. He kind of divides things right there which is smart because cranium has a lot more in the back. Ear here. And then for some reason he does this line. I'm not sure what that line is about. Like kind of, maybe that's a generalization of like the corners of the forehead maybe? I'm, I'm not sure where that's, why that's well, there. Well, he explains that, that particular line. So a 45 typically off of the ear will take you straight to the hairline. Yeah. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, I didn't didn't get too delved into the book on that point. So he shows this one, and then here's what he says about it. Drawing two is fine, really. It's this, it distinguishes the round character of the skull from the angular planes of the face. That's a good thing. I prefer the triangular sail shape in drawing three, however, because it's simpler. It's a little pointy in the back, but I'll add a couple of bells and whistles, and maybe you'll change your mind or not. <laughs> and it's kind of like he's he's giving you an out he's like hey you don't have to use this cell he's like this one no good don't do that one he's like this one's great it's a good head but this is what i like you know this is this is the houston and i would say i'm sorry houston we have a problem or i have a problem yeah as well <laughs> Again, well, this this goes back to our discussion a couple of days ago. It's like, what 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 is your shorthand? The mm -hmm. doing this like doing the sale like Steve Steve Houston would be like trying to copy his signature and call it your own. No, you're 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 like, oh, I like the way he does the H in his signature, so I'm going to copy that and add it to, to Chris. That'll be the H in Chris. Now. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great idea. I'll go to all these artists and find a good C. And it could <laughs> no, it'd be my last name, but. <laughs> uh, but, but yeah, it, it's it's learning what you can from him. You don't have to adopt his entire his entire head structure. Like you, even through the uh, the Loomis head that you've been doing, you you have adapted that and created your own little shorthand from it. And so, yeah. so figure out what works. he uses. Uh, Steve Houston uses all this as gesture. This is like Correct. his gestural approach. This is not, um, and probably maybe he uses this when he's creating a painting, he'll do a gesture of it, and then he'll build uh, his head. Oh, actually he does. The secondary structures of the head, he calls it. It's on page 122 in the book, and he shows how the sail turns into this super structured head. But at the beginning of this chapter, he has a head, and you know I could easily take a picture of it, but then um, the training wouldn't be there for me. Let me insert a new layer, and oh, this is going to be a little bit longer, guys. I'm going to do a very, I'm going to do a generalization of Steve Houston's generalization. So, wish me luck on this one of the head. It's maybe it's a little bit longer than that. 
and you know what you see that happens on all these heads the brow line the um, corner of the cranium I'm gonna call it I'm still trying to get those words to fit in my brain so they stay there all the time is there uh, those these lines that I'm always looking at I think he puts kind of a nose like right in the center and then the mouth is a little bit above center he does this really cool kind of blocky shape for the chin which I've seen that a lot of times like on the heads that I've been doing there's this space down here and a space there that I tend to forget, but he's got this interesting, oh, the question mark. I just remembered that from Marco Bucci's class. This little question mark shape. And this is a backwards question mark. Uh, and he actually shades, you know, this, just to indicate the downturn of the plane this, I believe this is a very male looking head, which is interesting. Not to, not to say that many um, female heads could be as blocky, but it's, it's very blocky. It's, it's kind of like, uh, oh, what's, his, what's his name? The, the blocky character guy that makes a bunch of books, like a hundred hands. Uh, that they look at on Watts Atelier. Oh my gosh, I got a bunch of his little small books. Bridgman. So this is Steve Houston's head, and he does some contour lines this way. This is like, uh, like further into the head shape, where he goes. I actually shades in the sides. Yeah, so that could be like the next step is something like this. But that's I actually when now that I'm looking at this, I'm like how much different is that from the um, from the Loomis head, right? I don't see a lot of difference there. Really the only only major difference I see is that it looks like he carves out the 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 shelf created by the brow. Almost mm -hmm. like the, yeah, almost like the Asaro head there, and then he really focuses on the rhythm of the chin to, to create that that bulging form. Yeah, below the mouth that a lot of like the Asaro head just ignores. So or yeah, not the Asaro, sorry. But... <laughs> Wait, you, I'm confused. You meant the Asaro head, right? No, the Asaro head. You, you've got a really clear chin shape on the Asaro head. The Loomis head has no form That's, on yeah. the chin. It comes That's down right. to the, the... Yeah, the difference between the two here is the features, really. Um, there's no nose on the Steve Houston one, and there's no real like indication of eye sockets, which, you know, basically is the nose. It, we have the outside of this eye socket here. You bring in the nose shape in some way. The glabellum. Yeah, the that's that's ah. the keystone. <laughs> I remembered that. Good job. <laughs> I did. <laughs> <laughs> Even Steve Houston calls it the the keystone, and that's fine. You don't need to remember glabellum. That unless you want to sound smart. Uh, yeah. I I'd rather sound stupid all the time. <laughs> it's closer to the real me. <laughs> well, this comes back to the the understanding, so you could teach it sort of thing. Especially if you could teach it to a five year old. I think a five year old would remember the word keystone much better than glabellum. Yeah, exactly. 
The other thing that I think that both of these are missing that's really important that I liked in the Marco Bucci way of doing things is this all important kind of shape here that the the bulge of the brow that happens. Uh, yeah, well, that's a very Riley rhythm. Yeah. Right there. That's super Riley. Um, Su super Riley. Super Riley. I might as well just do the head chakra Riley rhythm. Right? <laughs> like anytime you see that, you're like, oh, that's that's Riley. Yep. I I think that's that's the difference is you know the those kind of features. Of course, in Steve Houston's defense on this book, um, he does go into the nose in some of these drawings. But he really divides it up into all of these things. Actually, he goes pretty quickly into the anatomy. Shows, like, a much more complex head with muscles all over the, the head. Yeah. Yeah, he calls it a keystone. So I'll have to determine uh, the next step for the next 50 heads, honestly. And what's what's going to happen with that? I'm going to bring the Steve Houston book along with me on the trip, and that's uh, you know probably what I'll work on. Also, some ideas of you know a sorrow heads here. Uh, there, there's several different heads, and kind of like what I think would be the next step of practice. It could be instead of this memorized head from a sorrow. It could be the simplistic side of the planes of the head. Yeah. Do, yeah. do they make one that is just a full head with a simple plane? I don't... Yeah, I haven't seen it anywhere. I've seen people do 3D renderings Wait. of something similar to it. What's the one right next to it? That's the one we were looking at. This is the memorized, but it's different. If you look at this one, let me open it up in two different windows. Oh, they did it for me. And mm -hmm. so compare that yeah. one with this. You can see how the complexity comes in. It's got it's got that the globellum, okay. it's got, you know, the nose and yeah, it's got much more. Well, compared. I have an idea now that you have Blender. Um See if you can find a, a good 3D model of a full Asaro head. Then I want you to cut it in half, mirror the simple side, put it back together, and then send me the STL after you buy me a new 3D printer. And I will make, I will make you a simple only Asaro head. <laughs> but you do all of the work and pay me for it. Yeah, yeah there you go. I'm opening up my Asaro <laughs> head in Blender right now, so I can show you. Okay, yeah, I'm, I can bring this down. I'm in a weird place. I was talking. I have no idea what I'm on right now. I was making some changes to it, and I have no idea how to get back. I am not <laughs> learned in... Oh, I'm on texture paint layout. Here we go. Yeah, I finally installed Blender myself. Um, so I'm going to, I'm going to start playing with Blender after I found out my audience really loves Blender. I don't, I, I've never played with it. Yeah. I, I mean, honestly, I tried Daz Studio. It's terrible. It's just, yeah, it, it can't do, well, I don't know. It's, mm, well, it's you, a different you, use case. Yeah. Daz, Daz Studio is really made for posing models. Um, right. that's about it. You can build scenes in Daz Studio, but uh, really, it, it's catering to posing models. Mm -hmm. Let's see if I can move this light to the other side easily, so we can light the other side of the head. It actually, it did. You know, you spend a couple hours just playing with. Uh, Blender, and it doesn't take long. It is, well, if, if you're digitally inclined, which I am, it didn't take me long to kind of understand this. Um, the problem I'm having with it is this head, the, uh, this, see how the light is creating all these kind of crazy lines everywhere? Um, yeah. 
it, it was not so great. And it's still not so great. So trying to figure that out is one thing. But, you know, I'll be, be trying to do this. <clears throat> I won't be bringing Blender with me. I'll be trying to do this on my vacation the next week. So it's, it's going to be simplistic. It's not going to be Blender. It's going to be imagery. Maybe I'll jump on the internet if we have internet access and look at simple planes of the head. One other thing that I have linked in the very first video of this, the show notes, is on ArtStation. They have these things, and you can find these in a lot of different places on ArtStation. I wonder if I can make this full screen. Can I make this full screen? There it is. Nice. So this is different than all of them. Well, actually, it's, it's kind of close to the simple Asaro in both ways. And you can pose it. You can move it around. And if you... I'm trying to click on the little light thing here. This light thing rotates around. It goes horizontally as you play through it. I'll back up so you can see. Then it stops and then goes above it. It's all the way through. Stops and goes at a different angle, like into the front of the face, above, and then around the top, like... See how it does all these flybys? This is really interesting. So you can kind of almost get any kind of lighting condition with this. Uh, which I think is, is really cool. Yeah, that's that's pretty fascinating. It looks like they took the the simple plane to the face, but the more complex part of the nose and the eyes, and then just put it all in. That's that's beautiful. <laughs> I think this one's really great, and it gets even better because that's one, and then oh no, not that one. Uh, I'll have to go oh, to. Have to the... this ahead. Well, no, that was just... Okay, this guy... This is William Nugugin. Gugin? Anyway, follow him on ArtStation. He's awesome. He's got... There's a female and a male. See the difference that they have in there? It's just slight. Yeah. Which is kind of, you know... I could see some people that identify as female having this kind of structure of head. But you can see kind of the difference in this in there, which is really interesting. This is kind of a generalized difference between sexes, right? Um, right. But it's nice to have both. To, you know, maybe pick out a more angular head. Let the let that do its own flyby. Honestly, the more I look at this, the more I'm like, you know, this is the next step, really. Yeah, yeah, that that looks like uh, that. That's a great simplification right there. I, I really like it because I don't have to worry about Blender. I don't have to learn <laughs> a new program. I don't have to figure out all the weirdness that goes with it. Like, th this is hard to tell what's going on. Maybe if I move the light further away. Maybe if I move it closer. Maybe if I render it out. Maybe if I no, thank you. Let's don't save that. Right. So I am curious, does he sell that model? Is that in, in the marketplace? Why would you do that? It's like right here. Uh, maybe if you want to get more complex with it. I've tried to... Okay. Um, let's see. Let's see if he does. We'll, we'll go to his name and then... He does not have a selling... Usually they'll have like a store link up here so you could see what he's selling. But I don't see anything. Yeah. So I, no, I don't think so. Maybe there's a download in the description. Please do not copy the three D model for resale. Oh, I guess don't, because don't. it's. Go ahead. Well, he should. He he, he should sell it himself. I mean, obviously, it's good enough that he's he's throwing in a disclaimer not to copy it for resale. Even if he offered it as a like, 
if he doesn't want to sell it, just sell it at like a one dollar, a one dollar download. Boom. Yeah. Well, I mean, because I would buy it in, in a minute. I would. Yeah. <laughs> I'd give him a dollar. There you go. The lights in the way. Um, I'll probably take. Well, never mind. I don't need to take screenshots. I can just. There's all the the screenshots I need. Well, maybe I'll get some different angles or something like that. Um, from both heads and then just kind of work off of that for, you know, 50 more heads on these. Well, that, that's, a, that's kind of an interesting question I have here. The practice is to get fast in understanding the structure of the head. Okay. So this is the practice that I'm, I'm dealing with or want to do. Oops. Um, the I have been going off of photography at first and dealing with all these different head shapes and different individuals, which I think is really important. So yeah, I do. I uh, think I know where you're going here. Um, I would say try to internalize those planes over the next I don't know ten drawings, just different different angles. Um, try to internalize the planes, but draw it like you were the uh, the previous heads mm -hmm. and then go back to photographs and see if you can identify the planes on those photographs okay the other possibility is you know I take I take screenshots of this and then we go back into Krita Ugh, look at that ugly head <laughs> <laughs> oh, let's, let's do this uh, let's say that I'm working on you know, this head here. Because I'll probably oh. just repeat the photographs. And then maybe I have... Maybe not an exact, exact orientation, but a close orientation next to it. Maybe it's a lot smaller. Oof. Hit, hold shift, please. Hold shift. <laughs> you know, but you try to replicate. Yeah. Like, yeah. where do I see that on this person? Uh -huh. And then maybe a smattering throughout, like, because I I've done fifty different images here, and I'm just going to reuse those. But maybe I can get a lot of these heads in close to the same angle with close to the same lighting, and maybe do one, two, three, four, five with a photograph and the generalization next to each other, and then six and seven would be a photograph. And you try and remember Ooh. the planes. And then 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, you know, 13, 14, it has it with, you know, so it's not all the, the generalization of the head, but it's a combination of generalization and the photograph and matching in throughout. And then I think the, that's a good the, practice. Yeah. And then the further you go up, the, the less the, you use the head. Yeah. 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 Oh. I think that's that's probably what I'll do. That sounds like that sounds like fun. You, it, it, it trains that kind of slow. I'm gonna call it the training wheel technique. I love the idea of training wheels. I, th I think um, most individuals, when they think of training wheels, they forget the fact that you can lift them up slightly. Does that still work? Because you just you you're dealing with children that uh, are trying to ride bikes right now, right? Uh, so we we did something a little different with our kids. We took the training wheels off before we ever let them get on their bikes and pushed them down a but big we hill. Also, <laughs> well, no, we also we also took the pedals off so that they were their feet were on the ground and they could just glide with their feet close to the ground. Oh, um, nice. Because training wheels, in, in our experience, uh, they keep you from understanding how to turn a bike because they keep you way too upright. <laughs> well, see, that's, yeah, that's, that's what I'm saying. Is like training wheels, I thought that they were built so you can lift them up slightly. so that you're, They are, but you still, you still can't lean into a turn with training wheels lifted up all the way. Um, I see, I see, okay. Well, I still like the, as it's not a perfect analogy, but this idea that, um, let's, 
describe this visually. Where you're not, like, I want to get, uh, like, here's the, the spectrum. I always do this. Like, I want to be here. Master, right? <laughs> and I'm here. <laughs> novice. Or maybe that's at the very beginning. But maybe I'm right here. And you don't just go straight to the master, right? And actually, right. Kalen, yeah. Kalen Chalk, he, he did a, um, a concept art video. And he put this in terms of, you know, going to a big boss. And he's like, you know, the, he has your, like, little naked guy right here. And this big <laughs> boss over here, but drawn much better. And he's like, you wouldn't go straight to the boss. I mean, you get your butt kicked, right? He's like, you have to, along the way, you build up these little tools, you know. And by the time he was here and ready to face the boss, this guy had a cape on and a big sword and a shield and greaves and all kinds of cool stuff, you know. This awesome helmet. And he's like, I'm ready to kick your butt. Um, so that's, that's the practice where, you know, those planes are very new to me. So I'm going to kind of encroach my way there. I'm not going to just... You know, I guess the other terminology is the rubber band, right? You have a right. rub rubber band with your fingers in it. And you can stretch it a little bit without it snapping. But if you stretch it you know, way out here and it snaps, all of a sudden, bam, you're going to get pain on your finger. So we want to stretch but not snap. That kind of idea. So that would be the practice, you know. One through five would be um, the training wheels are already down. So it'll be photo uh, and planes. And then maybe two without. And then five more with. And then uh, three without. You know, something like this. And then we'll do three with. You know, I'll figure out like some different terminology, but the basic idea is you're getting less and less with those planes and more and more with just a photo and trying to remember those planes. I think I'll, I like that. And I, I yeah. feel like I'm kind of just rambling now. We're way past stream time. <laughs> I didn't even realize. Um, <laughs> my, my, my only caution or or commentary here would be the purpose of this is still to develop your shorthand by the end of it so in the end you might not even use or memorize all of the planes but you'll figure out the ones that you like the most at landmarks so figure out what works for you yeah that's that's something that i i want to address as well and I've, I've asked this from individuals before, and there's not just one way to draw anything. There, there's, you know, all kinds of different methods. You know, there's an atelier method, there's a um, Riley method, Loomis, you know, for just for heads alone, there's gestural. I mean, heck, you go into the natural way to draw and he'll give you like 20 different exercises of way to arrive at a drawing. And there are things that you never thought of before. And as you go through life and you're drawing and you're figuring out stuff, you start figuring out what works with your brain. And that, that's kind of how I say it. Because some things, you know, uh, like the sight size method. I tried it and I'm like, I hate this. It does not work with my brain at all right um so you know i've i've gone with more of an atelier method i've adjusted it in some ways here i'm focusing on the loomis method because i want structure you know this kind of stuff find the shorthand find the methods that work with your brain right make sure you get are getting out of your comfort zone getting feedback and things like that but um what kind of matches with your noggin, I guess? Not what's easier, that's not what I'm asking you to do, but what works well. And develop your own way. That arrives at what you like, what you love. Yeah, I think that's important. 
And I always need to come back to this painting as well. Here, here's going to be the test as well, Josh, just to keep you on here longer. Uh, <laughs> every 25, uh, I, was doing, I was doing this drawing to see if I could understand this head more, right? The planes right. of it and really get an understanding of it. And I've done it twice now, so I can return back to that. You know, the purpose for... And this is really good. I'm really happy with that. Yeah, that's... <laughs> But, you know, the real purpose of the reason why I'm doing this is because I don't, I didn't know a lot of this, and I want the light to be here. You Wait, know? where? Oh, okay. All right, so I see. Oh, let me zoom in. This little tiny thing. I want the light to be here. And, oh, actually, maybe a little bit higher above. So I want the major light to kind of hit there and then understand how it kind of cascades over the face uh, you know I wonder if I could do that you know how does it cascade over these forms shadow slight shadow bright light shadow you know these kind of things so you know it could end up that I just go into you know the next drawing phase and I'm also adding light and shadow to it as well. Okay. Okay. Could, could so for your next complexity. I don't know. I, I think for your next 50 heads, the last 10 that you do, you should uh, try to light it in a different way. So, right. That's so maybe five and five. So you do five of them with the simplification of the head in the same pose and angle as the photo but you light it from a different side so you have the reference for those five mm. like okay well I, I you should have a good understanding of the planes at that point so using a reference to light it from a different angle at first and then uh, for your last five try to light it knowing the forms knowing the simplifications but try to light it from imagination from a different side Ooh. And then you can check your work. Yeah. Okay. That's going to be fun. I'll be thinking about this on my trip and developing that strategy. Maybe I'll text you back and forth to get your opinion. <laughs> All right, guys. It is vacation time for me. I will not be back to the stream until the 8th of May. Um, so yeah, I will, uh, see everybody then. Thank you so much for watching and please, uh, return on the 8th. <laughs> and if you don't, that's okay. Cause I'll be working regardless. <laughs> <laughs> thanks for showing up, Josh. I pre appreciate the conversation. Uh, and thanks, thanks Doug again. Me. Yeah. Lots of fun. You guys have helped me out tremendously and hopefully if people uh, are bored enough to continue listening to this whole thing, <laughs> it helps them out too. Oh, man, I'm always denigrating myself. I need to stop doing that. <laughs> anyway. You're, all right. You're showing some impressive stuff, man. I'm excited. Yeah, me too. I am excited about this. This is great. All right. I'll talk to you later, Josh. Everyone else, see you in a week or more. Bye-bye.